And there's kind of two, there's also, I mean, there's stuff going into the kernel every release in terms of drivers and SOC support. I'm not gonna talk much about that, um, but I'll also cover a little bit of development stats. Um, so these are the kernel versions that we've had over the last year, starting with 5.14 in, in August of last year. And you can see the cadence, the, the duration of each release is about nine or 10 weeks. You can practically set your watch by it. Um, it's all, the kernel is always released on a Sunday evening. Um, and we're, we're three weeks in uh, to fi the 5.19 release candidate cycle. Um, so we expect uh, 5.19 at the end of July. Um, so this is boring. This is exactly what Lena said uh, in his keynote yesterday, that uh, you know, we, like the, we like the Linux process to be boring. Just a couple of things uh, in each of these kernel versions, I'll just point out. Uh, something called MemFD Secret was a new system call that was added. I'll talk about that. Some new tracers having to do with uh, 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 real-time analysis. A fair amount of Qualcomm and MediaTek driver code went into this release. Uh, clocks, pin controls, and sound drivers. And there's uh, a new driver called the Simple DRM uh, driver for uh, direct rendering interface for simple frame buffer devices, uh, which is good for, for embedded. So the MemFD secret system call, uh, this just creates uh, a region of memory that even the kernel can't access very easily. Um, it's, it's, it's to, it's, the purpose of it is to create a, a region of memory uh, that you can't unintentionally overwrite and that's even difficult for this kernel to access. Um, so, and this is a type of thing that you'd use to store uh, cryptographic keys or something. Um, of course, it's possible for, for the kernel to access ev everything with enough effort, but this uh, is, kind of hides the keys a little bit better. Um, in terms of 5.15, really, really big news is we finally got sleeping spin locks, and I've got a whole slide about this I'm going to talk about later for the real-time preemption patch. Um, the core scheduler has support for asymmetric uh, systems. So it turns out that there's chips that have, uh, particularly there's some ARM chips that have cores that can run 64-bit code and some cores that can run 32-bit code on the same, on the same core. So, the scheduler has to be kind of uh, aware of that, so it knows you know, which processes to run on which, which cores. And then if you happen to be doing something like a NAS server, um, you may be interested to know that the, there's a kernel version of the SMB server that's actually in kernel. Uh, it's not a full replacement for Samba, but uh, pretty interesting. Um, something called printk indexing. So uh, there's a bunch of uh, tools that are used for parsing logs from the Linux kernel. Um, and uh, what happens is as, as developers change the printk messages, those, those parsing tools break, right? They usually write regular expressions to say, oh, if I see this event from the kernel message stream, you know, that's something I need to report. Uh, but if the, uh, if the kernel messages change, then the, parsing, the, the log parsing breaks. But unknown, right? It's like silent. So now you can generate a, a list of all of the possible kernel messages for each release and see if the messages change so you can update your tools. Uh, so that's pretty good. There's a new data access monitor tool, uh, and uh, I'll talk about that. And the kernel, okay, so I know in embedded, uh, a lot of us are using old uh, kernels that were not at top of tree, right? We, the kernel we got from our vendor or whatever. Uh, it, when you switch to 5.15 or above, you're going to notice uh, that your builds break, probably, uh, because the kernel now uses the dash w error flag, which means that any kernel warnings are turned into an error that will break the build. And that's intentional to kind of encourage people, uh, you know, nudge them to fix all those warning messages uh, so that uh, we can get clean builds. Um, uh, the data access monitoring system I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, so this provides tools to record data access and show visualizations. Um, and there's a, a couple of different visualizations that are available. Uh, so it's a diagnostics tool, uh, like a lot of the other tracers we've got in the system. Uh, but is it actually more? Um, and in 5.16, we see that, yes, it is, uh, it's a sneaky way to get uh, some new functionality in. Um, so it, well, let me talk about these other ones. So the enhanced read-only file system uh, continued to get some, some uh, new features, multi-device support. 
So there's a lot of work been going on with uh, something called IOU Ring, which is the new asynchronous API for file IO. Uh, this is for high performance file IO. If you're, uh, if you're not using this in your product, uh, this is something maybe you want to look at. Uh, the thing in this release was they added support for SE Linux and SMAC uh, uh, security controls. Um, and then uh, data monitoring operation schemes was added. So now the data monitoring, you've got a diagnostics tool that can monitor uh, usage of memory, uh, but it now has uh, a way to actually do something with that in terms of hinting the kernel to reclaim memory. Uh, so this could help with low monitor situations. So if you have a product that is really low on memory, uh, this is something you might want to look at uh, in terms of, of handling low memory conditions. Um, uh, in 5.17, a uh, couple of changes. Uh, the kernel can now decompress uh, kernel modules uh, within itself. It doesn't have to rely on uh, user space to do that. And that's, uh, it turns out that that's important when you're doing a uh, type of secure boot where you're uh, looking at the hashes of, uh, and having the kernel uh, analyze the hashes of the, of the kernel modules. Uh, so the load pin security module, for example, uses that. Uh, the real-time Linux analysis tools were added, um, and, and they use those tracers that we mentioned before. And then there are some changes to the flags field. So if you're using uh, FUSE, I'm not sure if that's the right way to pronounce that, but uh, user space file system, there were some changes that might cause incompatibility, so uh, you need to watch for that. And then uh, 5.18. Uh, this is interesting. So support for some older architectures, ARM v4 and ARM uh, v5 MMU list systems was removed. Uh, so it's not always true that the kernel just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Sometimes stuff gets removed. Um, so there is still support for MMU list systems, uh, but uh, up, up at about ARM v7. Um, there's lots of risk stuff was added in this release, and the tracing, uh, the tracing system now supports user events. Uh, so if you need to trace user space applications, you can use uh, uh, tr kernel tracing for that. Um, and then the kernel compiles against the C11 language standard. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, and then the final thing uh, is that uh, in 5.19, we're, we're still in the merge window. This is not a released kernel yet, uh, but we've got a lot more SOC support and device drivers. The big news in this one, I think, from an embedded standpoint, is that the ARM multi-platform work is almost complete. So um, if you're not familiar, ARM, uh, all the ARM kernels used to build separately and uh, were different from each other. Uh, and now you can build a single kernel that you can feed it a device tree. It's called the generic kernel image. Uh, that you can feed it a device tree, and it can adapt and boot. Just like on, uh, on Intel, you never had to build like an Intel for each individual board. Uh, same thing on ARM. You no longer have to build a kernel for each individual board. Uh, you can build a generic kernel. Uh, so that's, that has been work going on for about eight years, and it's really nice to see all that consolidated. Um, there's initial support for a new architecture uh, by Lungsan, which is a Chinese chip manufacturer. So new architectures are going in. And then there's a new hardware timestamp engine, which I'll, I'll talk about that again uh, later also. So in terms of developer stats, in case, you, in case you've not noticed, if you've been looking at my URLs, um, I really owe uh, LWN.net, uh, you know, a, a debt of gratitude, and, and I see Jake is here, and I'll, I'll uh, like buy him a drink or something after the after the session. Uh, but we get all this data from LWN.net. If you're not a subscriber, please go subscribe. Uh, they do excellent work, and if you want to stay on top of stuff in the in the Linux community, go do this. Uh, uh, pay pay them a little bit of money. So uh, there's about 15,000 changes in this release, which is pretty average. Uh, you can see the areas where uh, some of this is happening, device tree updates, uh, folio patches, refactoring of the block and FS. Christoph Helwig is always in the top five because he's always refactoring something. Um, if you see by lines of code, then you see that the GPU for the AMD driver, almost 400,000 lines of code <laughs> in one release. Uh, so that's pretty, that's pretty heroic there. Um, but you see, you know, you, you can get into the top stats by removing stuff, too. Uh, um, so, and then in terms of commit log entries, this, uh, the stats for this are just a little bit numbers different because I use my own tools for this. But um, it's about 
13,000 to 16,000, somewhere in their range of uh, changes every release. So that's every, every 10 weeks. That is pretty amazing when you think about it. I mean, sometimes you got to take a step back. Oh, the other thing, I want to back up and, and just point out one thing real quick. So there's a, Linus said that he thought there were about 1,000 developers on, on Linux every release. It's actually closer to 2,000. It's pretty consistently around 2,000 developers. And if you have never contributed to the Linux kernel, note that uh, about two to 300 every release is a new developer. So if you've never contributed, don't, don't be shy about saying, well, you know, the Linux kernel, it's done by all these experts. No, there's new developers every single release. So, uh, you know, go ahead and, and jump in and, and contribute your stuff. Um, just a real quick, uh, I didn't finish the, the slide on this one, but uh, about 40% of all bug reports are now coming from automated test robots. Okay, so the reported bylines, uh, uh, we're getting a lot of reports from, um, from test robots. Okay, so technology areas. Uh, these are the areas I'm going to go over real fast. And again, I apologize. Uh, these slides will be ama made available after the talk. And actually, I have a detailed version of these slides that is the full hour and a half that I gave just a couple of weeks ago for Japan that I'll also uh, include a reference to. Um, but, so in, in the area of audio, so Pipewire is kind of the new shizzle. Uh, you got to be looking at that uh, for your new products. Uh, Pulse Audio is not taking it lying down, though. They've just had a new release, uh, Pulse Audio 16. Um, I told you I was going to go fast. Uh, in the core kernel, we have these things I already talked about, memfd secret, print k indexing. Uh, so the kernel compiles against C11. So what is that about? Um, it turns out that... Uh, they found out that because of the, our adherence to the C11 spec, uh, the, where variables need to declare, be declared inside certain kernel macros, uh, according to that spec, it was leaking information that you could detect with speculative execution uh, attacks. And so uh, they made the decision to go ahead and uh, move to a newer version of the spec that allows you to declare variables right in the for loop. Uh, and so this, uh, this unscopes the variable better. And so that was actually the, the justification for this move. And I think it's a good move. I mean, uh, you know, it, we, can, we can come out of the 90s uh, for, or the 80s actually. It was the C89 was the last spec we were adherent to. The other big news in the, in the core of the kernel is this Rust. Uh, this was talked a lot about by Linus and Dirk. Um, so there's this effort going on to support Rust code in the kernel. Uh, the patches are still considered experimental. And there's, uh, the support for these patches was recently moved to a recent version of Rust. There's some grousing about how fast that changes. It's about 35,000 lines of code. It's out of tree. And there's ongoing debate. There's a debate raging this week on one of the kernel mailing lists about you know, whether we should let it in or you know, what are the ramifications. Uh, but most kernel developers are on a wait and see, and we're willing to see what happens with it. Uh, in terms of file systems and I.O., uh, so like I said, I.O. U-Ring, which is the new asynchronous I.O. that continues to mature. Um, and uh, there's, there's a bunch of new stuff happening. Zero copy networking, there's some patches flying around for that. Uh, in terms of uh, enhanced read-only file system and F2FS, flash-friendly file system, uh, those continue to mature with better compression support, better X attribute, and then there's those uh, changes to uh, Fuse uh, that you need to be uh, watching. In terms of graphics, a uh, couple of small things and a couple of big things. So simple DRM driver was merger, merged. Uh, the frame buffer uh, FBDev subsystem was kind of orphaned, but it got a new maintainer. So that's really good for us in the embedded space. Uh, we have these old devices with 2D uh, things and it wasn't being supported really well by DRM. There was some conflict. The DRM maintainers uh, didn't like uh, some of the things that the new maintainer did, resurrecting some code that they thought should die. Uh, but that friction was all eased over, and hopefully, you know, I'm hoping this uh, the new maintainer does a good job. Um, so one of the things, though, Molly GPUs. Molly is a GPU architecture that ARM has been supporting. Uh, that now has a fully conformant OpenGL driver. Uh, fully open source. Uh, we have a lot uh, Colabora to thank for that. Uh, also, really big news, uh, NVIDIA has announced that they are going to open source a lot of their code. Uh, so 
uh, they've actually released some of the code already. It's not upstream, uh, but this represents a big shift uh, for NVIDIA. Uh, and I, you know, I happen to have an NVIDIA card on my desktop, and it's a pain. It's a hassle to deal with the proprietary drivers. So sometime in the future, uh, you know, maybe I'll be able to use an open source driver that's all upstream. That would be awesome. Not sure the effect of this on the existing open source project, which is the Nouveau project, but uh, this is something, definitely something to watch and kind of big news. Networking, there's just kind of a steady stream of uh, weird networking stuff going on. Um, no, not, not a lot of new uh, protocols, uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the esoteric protocols that get in are not really relevant to embedded. Um, but there is this new thing with, uh, there's an internal function that allows uh, driver authors to instrument to provide the reason that they're dropping a packet, and so that will help with some diagnostics. Um, Okay, so real time. So this is really, really big news. Uh, uh, well, the small one, small news is there's some new tracers, real time Linux analysis tools. The big news is RT preempt, right? So sleeping spin locks went in in 5.15, and then patches have been going in continuously through 5.19. So the sleeping spin locks, if you're unfamiliar with that, or this is uh, um, this is what allows a process uh, to switch while a lock is being held, and, and this is what allows you to get low latencies guarantees through the kernel. And this is a core, core feature of uh, preempt RT. Pro possibly, I think this is probably the core feature of preempt R uh, RT patch set for Linux real time. So you have to turn on a config option to get this, but um, this has been extensively tested and verified. Uh, it's been 17 years in the making. Okay, it's taken 17 years uh, to get this uh, feature into the kernel. Um, so what the uh, natural question is what's left? Uh, so if you go look at the actual patch set, uh, it's not big. It's about 1,300 lines of code in only about 50 patches. Okay, and that may sound like a lot, but compared to where this was before, it's unbelievable. And they've, they've upstreamed about 1,700 uh, 1, lines of code just since February. So, I mean, if you were to extrapolate that, they, you know, the whole thing would be upstreamed by August, but of course there'll be, there'll be details. Like the print K code they just got up apparently had to be taken back out because there were some bugs or something. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, there is a Birds of a Feather session with Steve Rostet. Uh, on Friday, so make sure you go to that. Um, in terms of security, uh, we basically have a whole bunch of kernel hardening. There's something called control flow integrity uh, to uh, make sure that you're jumping to the place you thought you were jumping to, uh, and then um, mem copy bounds checking, and uh, there's always a stream of specter mitigations. Specter is specter as, as, uh, as an exploit is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, and so one thing I thought was interesting is there's actually been a removal of some specter mitigation code that was found to not be very effective and kind of uh, bad for performance. Um, I'm, running, I'm running behind, but I'm going to try to squeeze these out quick. So Zero Day is doing an awesome job of, of helping reporting bugs at the time of patch submission. Uh, there's Kernel CI and Sysbot that are finding a bunch of jug, uh, a bug, CKI and LKFT. I just want to point out, if you haven't seen this other one, Compass CI, I think that's a new uh, automated testing framework to watch. It's by Huawei. It's by the same developer who did Zero Day. So he went from Intel over to Huawei. Uh, so this is one, I think, to pay attention to, because he, uh, uh, if you look at it theoretically, he, he really knows uh, what he's doing in terms of testing. There's a whole bunch of suites that have new releases, new tests, new coverage. Um, don't need to talk about those. GCC versions, uh, GCC 12.1 uh, was released in May, so point release for them. And the new focus seems to be, one of, one of the things that comes out is uh, uh, a lot of really good stuff to, to handle uninitialized variables. Uh, there's some uh, runtime stuff uh, and also some static analysis stuff that's in this version. Uh, so uh, that's, that's pretty good. So more catching of bugs. LLVM also had a point release in May. Uh, people are using this for whole distributions, not just for, uh, not just for the kernel. Um, and there's, uh, if you're interested in that, uh, using it either with Yocto or, or uh, some, other, some other way, uh, there's a, a good talk by Bernard Rosencrantz around that. Okay, um, tracing, uh, 
Steve's not here, so I can just skip over this quick. Uh, the, oh, the only thing here, the t hardware timestamp engine, uh, this is a pretty neat system for um, actually causing the hardware to grab a timestamp based on a hardware event, so without any software like interrupt required. Uh, that is really good for, for low, low cost, um, uh, low, low overhead tracing of some events. Okay, so I'm sorry how fast that was. I know it was a quick run through. The slides will be online. The main reason for that type of quick run through is just so you have in your mind uh, like a search term that you can go look up uh, and go find it on lwn.net and read like the full article. Uh, so in terms of industry news, I want to talk about just a couple of things. So we have the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, and in particular the Alpha Omega Project, and a couple of miscellaneous things. So uh, if you haven't heard of the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, you've got to be living under a rock, or you missed the keynotes yesterday. Um, but this is a, a big comprehensive project to analyze security throughout the o open source uh, ecosystem. Um, and uh, they're going to do a whole bunch of things, vulnerability disclosures, security tooling, best practices. Uh, they are well-funded. They have over $70 million of funding, and they're well-connected. So uh, uh, the people from the Open Source Security Foundation represented the open source ecosystem at the White House at a special cybersecurity summit and also at some recent congressional hearings. Uh, so this is good. We have a... Um, a well-funded organization that's looking at security. Here's some of the activities they're going to be uh, doing. They're going to be doing scorecards and reviews of existing code bases, a metrics dashboard, uh, package feeds and package analysis, um, and then doing a best, uh, best practices badging program so that you can see if you're, using, if you're dependent on certain components, you can see if they have a certain level of security badging. Uh, they have some standards for uh, vulnerability schema and uh, something called SALSA, the supply chain levels for software artifacts. So they're, getting, they're doing the SBOT uh, software bill of materials work. Um, and then also guides and training. So there'll be a vulnerability guide and, and help uh, if you want to work on security. One of the big projects they recently announced was called the Alpha Omega Project. And uh, this is an es effort to systematically search for vulnerabilities in open source code. Uh, the alpha part of it is they're going to identify like the top uh, 100, I think, or th maybe 1,000, but the top critical code that uh, like is in widest use, and then actually go fund, uh, you know, developers go in and, and find problems and fix problems. But the problem with open source, or I don't know if it's a problem, it's a benefit, is there's this huge long tail, right? There's over 10,000 uh, packages <coughs> or libraries, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, that need to be analyzed and need, and a lot of them have very few maintainers, right? There's like uh, uh, one maintainer or two maintainers, and uh, the project doesn't have enough resources, e even as well-funded as it is, to go after all those. So they're gonna do things like provide training, and uh, provide automated tools to help people analyze their own. And hopefully, as a community, uh, we can raise the level of uh, uh, security of all, of all of the open source uh, that we use. Uh, so that, I think, is a really good project. In terms of miscellaneous, I have to note, uh, this, this one was interesting, that uh, Intel has acquired Linutronics. Uh, so Linutronics is the company that um, Thomas Gleichsner I don't know if you know who that is, but he's the guy behind Preempt RT. Uh, so Intel has uh, acquired them. They're, they're now, I guess, Intel employees. Uh, but uh, I think that represents a good sign that Intel is going to keep funding uh, Thomas to work on uh, security stuff. And then uh, I've, been hear I've been hearing a lot more uh, seeing stuff about Onero. Uh, I had never heard of this before. Maybe it's been around and I'm just out of the loop, but uh, it's a project by the Eclipse Foundation. It's an IoT operating system. So it sounds like a user space stack, or if you don't have user space, just a stack. Um, it's a distributed IoT OS. I don't know that much about it. Uh, I saw a bunch of, uh, I'm on the program committee uh, for ELC Europe. And there were a bunch of talks uh, submitted on this. So. Um, it has blueprints to build end-user-ready products, uh, according to information I've seen, and it's Yocto-based, builds the entire system uh, at one time. So this is something maybe to watch and look into. We'll, I'll see more at uh, ELC Europe. 
Um, I, I got to talk some about, uh, I guess I'm doing okay on time, so I, I may have rushed too fast. I got to talk a little bit about Mars Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, so for years, uh, I've been asking, have we got Linux on Mars yet? And it turns out we finally did, right? So we got uh, the Ingenuity helicopter. It's a little helicopter. And in there is some custom off-the-shelf hardware uh, that is uh, running Linux. Uh, on Mars is just amazing. So it landed last February, well, not this last one, but February 2021, and uh, prefer performed its first five flights, and, and it was supposed to just be a technology demonstration. Um, but uh, it did really well, um, and it is still flying. It has performed 29 flights so far. Um, just a couple of uh, recent news. Um, uh, they had an opportunity to go back and look at the, the back shell as, as, the, as the rover and the helicopter, as they come down the descent, there's a, a part of it called the back shell that has the parachutes that, that flies off and, and crashes separately from the rover itself. And so they were close by, so they went over and took some pictures. The first time ever, they've been able to get detailed pictures of what some of the crash site looks like. It's not just a super cool picture to see, you know, a picture from this on, a, on another planet, but it actually has scientific value because they can analyze the debris field and, and, uh, and see, you know, what the effect was of the landing, you know, how fast it landed and how the debris spread. And so they can use that information for future. In terms of updates, uh, it's the little helicopter that could. It's, uh, uh, bless its little heart, it's trying to survive the Martian winter. Uh, we are entering Martian winter, and uh, it's getting, there's colder weather and less sunlight, and there's dust on the solar panels, and so it has been having problems maintaining enough charge. Uh, so uh, the helicopter right now, it's supposed to, it's supposed to charge enough to, to heat the CPU core, keep, the, keep its core cold overnight or warm overnight. Uh, now it doesn't have enough power to do that, so it has to let the actual the computer shut off. So Linux shuts off overnight, and uh, if the core temperature gets down to about negative 80. These are off-the-shelf parts. In fact, some of the parts for the helicopter they ordered from SparkFun. Uh, and, and they're not rated for negative 80 Celsius. So uh, anyway, so because of this shutdown, they had problems with the clock synchronization, and they missed one of their communication windows. They were very worried. Uh, also, the inc I think because of the cold temperatures, the inclinometer is now broken, uh, but NASA uh, figured out how to way to compensate for that by using other sensors. And of course, NASA being NASA, they had a patch ready. <clears throat> I don't think they've, I think they have yet to submit it, but they're going to do a live update, right? They're gonna update in the field on Mars. Uh, that's pretty cool. And uh, just, so NASA knew this was gonna happen or they figured it would happen. And so they had prepared and tested a patch months ahead of time. So the patch that they're sending is actually several months old. Uh, but that just shows you how cool NASA guys are. Um, uh, guys and gals. Uh, so this, it's, it's keeping up with the rover as best it can, and it actually goes and scouts locations for the rover. Totally cool. I think uh, it's one of the most interesting uses of embedded Linux in the solar system. Uh, if you want to get more technical details, uh, Tim Canham uh, is the JPL uh, lead on, the, on this stuff, and uh, he gave a great keynote at last year's Embedded Linux conference, and so you can get a lot of the technical details about you know, what version of Linux and, and uh, diagrams of their CPU utilization while they're in flight and stuff like that. Um, so, scorecards. So, I have, I have to move through my scorecard stuff. I took too long on the helicopter. I knew I would. Uh, so are we done yet? Well, it depends. Where are we? So I'm going to, oh, let me back up. I'm going to talk about three different scorecards, technology, development, and markets. So the original focus areas that we decided in 2003, uh, how are we doing on those? Well, if you look at the contributions to the Linux kernel, all right, we don't see very many on system size or boot time or really uh, power management. Real time, I just said, was done. So we're done, right? Uh, well, you know, so congratulations, everyone. We did it. It's like, well, okay, let's back up a step there. So system size. We're, yes, we're done. We don't see a lot of system size patches going into the kernel. That's because we kind of gave up. 
The lower limit is about 16 meg. Well, I, don't say, I won't say we gave up. Uh, Moore's law made it so that we could care less. <laughs> well, and that sounds bad if you say could care less, but um, alas, Linux is never going to run on one cent processors. And believe me, okay, there are such things as one cent processors. Uh, and they're not a capable of running Linux. Uh, so those 10 trillion IoT nodes uh, that we were hoping to run on, we're not going to be running on those. It'll be something smaller like our uh, free RTOS or, or, or Zephyr. Um, but, you know, we're in, we're in a pretty good space. So boot time. Uh, we, we're done. We don't see any boot time things. Well, cold, cold boot time reduction. We don't see any new patches for that. Most products these days are, they're just kind of cheating, right? They're going into suspend resume or they're going into a low power state. Like my phone, you think your phone is off, it's not off. You think your TV is off, it's not off. Okay, so cold boot, again, we kind of gave up, um, uh, but we've, we've worked around the problems. Um, power management, is that done? This one is harder to call. Uh, so the Stuff we need to do power management. Ooh, three minutes. Ooh, I'm off on my timing. Oh, I better. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm gonna have to really hustle. Um, it. We have the stuff we need to upstream, but uh, but it requires SOC and board support. So uh, you you really rely on your architecture or your your SOC vendor to to write the drivers that utilize those features upstream. In terms of real time done, yes, preempt RT code is almost all upstream, but again, it's going to require ongoing maintenance. And security, of course, is, is an in progress thing. Uh, so the technology scorecard looks much more like this. Um, I'm going to go through the development scorecard. These are the areas that make it good or easy to develop for Linux. And I'm going to say that actually we're doing really well. We have tons of build systems and distributions. Uh, we have uh, good training and consulting. Um, lots of companies are available to help you with your projects. Uh, our tool chains are really in good shape. Um, and SOC vendors take care of, uh, of writing a lot of the code for the tool chains. Debugging capabilities are good. I would say test systems are still in progress. I think there's still a lot of work, a lot of gaps in testing that we can fill uh, with automated testing, particularly in the area of hardware testing. Um, and then hardware support, I think, also is still in progress. So we've come a really long ways. SOC vendors now very customarily provide support, uh, write drivers. But the issue is that it, oftentimes it's not upstream. And uh, so it's very, and, and that requires that as product makers, if you're right, making an embedded Linux product, you're having to do a lot of extra work and carry a lot of extra technical debt uh, because of that. Uh, but things are improving. Um, and so I'm going to give our overall development scorecard a, a mostly good and a couple areas in progress. Uh, and then the market scorecard. And I know this is not a comprehensive list of the markets, uh, but uh, just really quickly, drones, we're doing great. Walmart is about to roll out uh, drone delivery in 34 states, so uh, get ready to be attacked by, from the skies. Uh, Amazon has also announced trials in California, and most of those drones are running Linux. Uh, robots, robot operating system is really kind of taking over the world. It's already uh, majority in academia, and it's also projected to be 55% in uh, commercial robots. Cars, uh, AGL just released uh, a new release with instrument cluster and in, uh, infotainment, and it's used in a lot of telematics and uh, self-driving. Um, and then in space systems, uh, surprisingly, you know, I thought this would be the last uh, frontier, uh, but Starlink is running Linux, space rockets, the Mars helicopter, there's a lot of CubeSats running Linux. I think as we get more commodity hardware up into space, uh, which, will, which will happen as launch costs come down, we'll see Linux even more in space. Routers, anyone can make a router running Linux. Uh, mobile phones, we have 70% market share with Android. And for consumer electronics, we're, we're just killing it. Uh, we're, uh, I think it's about 100% of TVs, uh, about 100% uh, of DVRs, most cameras, uh, a lot of audio. So we are doing really well in these verticals that I chose for, for, for this session. Um, so conclusions. Overalls, we're doing really well. Uh, Linux is widely deployed and embedded. Uh, I would say we're at world domination. We're not going to be in the low-end devices. That's kind of disappointing. 
but you know, one meg RAM system that's uh, running on just harvested energy, uh, that's going to be tough, and I don't think we'll get there. We're not going to see Linux on a serial box. Uh, that's a callback for any of you who are here <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, core kernel systems, though, are in place to handle everything we need to do in embedded. Uh, new hardware keeps being made, so of course we've got to keep writing new drivers. Uh, core code can always be improved. But uh, the bottom line is we're not done yet, uh, but that's okay. Uh, this is, we've got job security uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, hopefully uh, you can use Linux in whatever embedded product that, uh, that you want to build. And um, I, I want to encourage you to go forth and, and use embedded Linux. And I hope that uh, especially here at the conference you find out the bits of information that will help you uh, make a better product and help you also uh, become an active and uh, productive member of our ecosystem and our community. Uh, and so with that, I will say thank you for your time. <laughs> and I don't know, do we have time for questions or are we? One question, I guess. I know, it's like after you've drunk from a fire hose, it's like, anybody? Okay. Oh. Oh, I will get the slides up. Uh, they're supposed to be, well, keynotes, they give you a, a, an exception. And I'm calling this a keynote for that reason. <laughs> so, but I'll get these up by the end of the day. So they should be on the, the, the site. Okay. The, the question was, when will the slides be up? And they'll be up soon. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks.